Uh, welcome to church in the quote-unquote park. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming out this morning. Uh, your bulletin's in front of you. If you haven't already done it, there's a... Uh, uh, if you, does anybody not have a bulletin? We didn't have it out a little while ago. If you don't have one, there's one on the table over there, and we can get it to you. Uh, offering boxes over there as well, and um, there's an attendance sheet also. If you haven't uh, signed into that already, that's how we'll do attendance this morning. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. Well, okay. We're having some issues with the YouTube stream, so if anybody who is watching on Facebook, because that's what we're doing it on right now is Facebook, and you know, and, and somebody is complaining because they can't get the YouTube live feed, tell them to go to Facebook, and they should be able to watch it there. I'll post it this afternoon, too, so. Awesome. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with our opening song. you were worried, we are going to do the Athanasian Creed this morning. I know. 
Uh, we'll do it responsibly. The words are in your bullet, and, and we'll do it in parts as well. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this. That For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. Such is the Father, and such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father I created, the Son I created, the Holy Spirit I created. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. This is there are not three uncreated, or three infinites. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet there are not three Almighty's. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three words but one word. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, you've given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship in unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign in one God now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today is from Genesis chapter 1. It's a creation story. I don't look as cool <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> it's good to have people to keep you together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters were gathered together, and he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, of each according to its time on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, which is in their seed, each according to its time. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, and third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to be separate, to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. 
And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed that is fruit. You shall have the food, and to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue to creed. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so we are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been said above, the Trinity and Unity and Unity and Trinity is to be worshipped. We continue with our uh, second reading. It's from Acts chapter 2. It's a continuation of last week. Peter, standing over the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch of David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne before Solomon spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses of, of that. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom we crucify. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be and we conclude the creed. It is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believes in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. 
perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not to the one of us. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God.
The grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy uh, being outside. Happy church in the park. Uh, and as uh, looking at the, the readings and the setting that we're in, uh, we read the account of creation in Genesis 1. We're out here in God's creation. So I thought it was fitting uh, for a few minutes this morning for us to think about what's our relationship with God's creation. I think we have a tendency to end up on one side or the other, where I think the greatest temptation for us today is to be disconnected from God's creation because we're so focused on our creations. I mean, you think about the amount of time we, we spend uh, in, in, in some sort of technology, some sort of media, something that we have created. I mean, the amount of time uh, you know, kids uh, they spend outside versus inside. Uh, the connection that we have with God's creation is oftentimes only as consumer of it when it's convenient, uh, rather than a caretaker of it. And what happens when we disconnect from the creation is it's easy for us to disconnect from the creator. When we lose sight of the gift, we also lose sight of the giver of the gift. And that's, so that's kind of a temptation on one side. On the other side, we can actually become so focused on the creation, we lose sight of the creator. We lose sight of the God who made all things, the God who is holding all of this together. And on either end of the spectrum, we lose sight of God, and also we lose sight of our role within creation. See, we read Genesis chapter 1, and it goes through the creation of the light and the dark, and the waters and the sky, the plants and the birds, the animals. And oftentimes I think we forget that we're on the list. We are not separate from God's creation. We are actually a part of, yes, perhaps the pinnacle of God's creation, made in the image of God, but we are part of God's creation. We are our creatures. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, for us to be a creature, really, at its most simple point, means that if I'm a creature, I have limits. If I'm a creature, if I am created, then I have limits. And we don't like limits. How many of you guys like speed limits? No, speed limits, they're the minimum for most people. Like you're only going the speed limit. Get moving or get out of the way. That's most of the time how we drive. Right? Limits, I don't really like that word. But what's every child's favorite word? No, when they say it, but the least favorite when their parents say it, because we don't like someone telling us no, what we can and we can't do. We don't like limits. When we look at, at a, the schedule overall for most Americans, the thing that we pride ourselves in the most is that we're busy. If someone asks you how you're doing, the acceptable answers are good, fine, or busy. That's it. Being busy is a is a badge of honor, as if we're playing, you know, this this game show for for the world entitled "Oh, you think you're busy," and then when we hear someone else's life, we then, you know, oh, here's what I've had to do with with my day. Here's everything that I've go, going on, and it's seen as a badge of, of pride. How many people take the, the phrase "workaholic" and they just they accept it? Yeah, that, that's I, I work way too much. That's who I am. As if that is a healthy thing. We don't like limits. And yet to be a creature, to be a part of God's creation, means that we have limits. And at its core, temptation leads us to deny the limits that God has placed within his creation. 
Take a look at Genesis chapter 3. The, the first temptation that Adam and Eve fall into. The temptation is, no, you won't surely die if you eat of this, this fruit that God told you not to. No, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, at its core, that temptation is to take the two limits that God has given and to say, no, I don't want to be limited. God told me I can't do this. I don't like that limit. God told me I can't know this. I don't like that limit either. See, at its core, those two same temptations that make their way to our lives. I want to know everything, and I want to be able to do everything. How many of you know someone that knows everything? Or thinks they do? Don't, don't start pointing at the people around you. <laughs> someone that knows everything, or, or thinks that they know everything. How helpful are they when you have a problem? And they think they're helpful because they, they know, I know the solution. Oh, here's exactly what you need to do. How empathetic are they? How willing to receive criticism are they? How willing are they to cooperate and, and work? No, knowing everything, or rather thinking that we know everything, is actually one of the worst positions we can put ourselves. And we do that in relationships with, with one another. We, we think we know everything. I don't need help. I, I don't need anyone else. Or, or on the flip side, I'm the only one who can help. I'm the only one uh, who can fix things. And what we do is we take that not just with our relationships with others. We act that way with God. So when all of a sudden something's happening that doesn't make sense to me, who must be wrong? Well, well God must be because I figured it all out. If God just, just looked at the way I, I mapped this all out, he would understand uh, that, that this is the right way. And, and so since there's a discrepancy between what I think is rational and what God has said, God must be wrong. And so we then, we walk away, we change God's word, we, we find some way to make it make sense in our own world, and we become our own gods. desire for us to know everything ends up putting ourselves outside the limits that God has created and it's never a healthy, a safe place to be outside of those limits. And the other core rebellion is not just to know everything but also to be able to do everything. Is that I don't like the limits that God has set that he has placed. I, I, I want to, to be with whoever I want. I want to be able to do whatever I want. It's my time. It's my money. Uh, it's my relationship. It's my body. I can do whatever I want. And yet how often does that lead us to when we step outside of the limits that God has placed? Does that really lead to the place of happiness, success, and fulfillment that we think of this? Perhaps temporary, but never ultimately, and never in the long run. And when we think we can do whatever we want, the people around us are the ones that suffer. Because at the end of the day, it's just it's about whatever I want. It's about whatever I need. And again, our relationship with God that then turns into, well, God, I'll listen to you as long as you agree with me, as, as long as I can do whatever makes me feel happy, as long as, long as I can do whatever I want. It's the same temptation that Adam and Eve fell into in Genesis 3 is the same that's being just recycled with us each and every day. You can know everything. You can do everything. And so we look at creation. We look at where God has placed us. And what we're inviting into is to realize, instead of seeing these limits as a bad thing, we can actually see the fact that we are created, that we are limited as a blessing. So what's our relationship with God's creation? Is it's meant to be the fact that I am a creature, and that means God takes care of me. And everything's not on, on my shoulders. That the God takes care of me and that he's going to give me enough. 
for us to realize I can't know everything. But I can know enough. I can know something. See, on Trinity Sunday, the, the you can't know everything is kind of straight in our faces. I mean, we read through the Athanasian Creed and like, I can't explain the Trinity to anyone other than saying those words, you know, verbatim. Any image that we try to use, well, it's like an apple. No, that's actually there. It's like water. No, all of the things that we try to use end up falling short. And so instead of saying, well, let me, let me shrink God down so he makes sense to me. What Trinity Sunday actually invites us to do is simply to say, here's who God has said he is. I may not fully understand it. I may not be able to uh, convince someone. I may not be able to find an image that totally works. And for us to go, I'm a creature. It's okay. I shouldn't expect to understand God. I shouldn't expect for God to do everything that I want because I'm a creature. I shouldn't expect to know better than God. And for us to say, this is what God has given me. This is who God has said he is. That's enough. I'm going to trust it. In John chapter 6, there's uh, this great moment uh, for Jesus' disciples. Now, the disciples get it wrong an awful lot in the Gospels. If, if you've read through them, it's more often than not the disciples doing, doing the wrong things. But in John chapter 6, he's just finished teaching about how he's the bread of life. And, and most of the chapter is this argument between Jesus and uh, actually his followers, his disciples. And, and as we get to, to verse 60... It says, after this, many of his disciples stopped following Jesus. Because they couldn't understand it. Because it didn't make sense. And Jesus turns to the 12 disciples, turns to his course of disciples, and he says, are you going to leave as well? And it's interesting to know what they don't say. They don't say, oh, no, we've got it figured out. Yeah, those guys just didn't understand. Here's how all the pieces put together. It's not really a hard teaching. Uh, they just didn't quite understand. They weren't at our level. They don't say that at all. What they say is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's the confession of us living in God's creation. I don't know everything, but what I do know is enough. Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. They're not saying, I completely understand it. I can totally explain it. This makes perfect sense to me. They're saying, no, God, I don't get you. I don't understand this, but I trust what you have given me that I can hold on to. You have the words of eternal life. We can't know everything, but we can know something. And what God gives us is enough. That's why we hold on to things like the creeds. Say, I may not be able to perfectly understand this, but what God has given me is enough. That's why in the midst of, of, of death and disease and things we don't understand, where do we turn to? We turn to the words of God that are clear. We turn to the God that overcomes death, that forgives sins, the God that shapes the ending of the story. So it's not just about the things that we can't understand, but ultimately there is a day where all of this will be answered in Jesus Christ. We can't know everything. We're not going to know everything. See, these same disciples in John chapter 6, you would think after the resurrection, they now get it. Our gospel reading from Matthew 28 has one of my favorite verses in, in all, all scripture. Yes, the Great Commission, that's one of them. But actually the verse right before that, if you know, the verse 17 of our, of our reading through that. So they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, and some doubted. Now what's going on there? You th they, they've seen Jesus, he raised from the dead, he fulfilled the prophecy. They worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, you and I, in that scenario, we would go, all right, guys, go on. 
I'm going to pick the ones that did it out, and you're going to be my disciples from now on. What does Jesus do? He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And he says it to all of them. Because who has the authority to send? Jesus does. He says, it matters less to me that, that you don't fully understand everything. You, see, you are going to have doubts. You are going to have questions. Because you're not God. And yet, I'm gonna, what I'm going to give you is going to be enough. Go. Make disciples by baptizing, which is the gift from God. By teaching, which is the word of God. I'm going to give you what you need. So go. Go with your doubts. Go with your questions. Go with your, I'm not really sure how to explain this. I don't really understand this. He says, you have my spirit. You have my word. You have my sacraments. So go. It's enough. And, and that, that comforts me as this, we try to sometimes figure all things out. Because I don't have to know everything. I don't have to know everything to share my faith with someone. I don't have to be able to answer all their questions. Because what God has given me is enough. He's given me a spirit. He's given me his word. He's given me his gifts. He's given me his people. That's enough. And for us as God's creatures to simply hold our hands out and receive that. And say, yeah, I'm limited. I'm not going to understand everything. And that's okay. I'm not going to drive myself crazy by trying to figure everything out. And to simply trust and receive from the hands of God what he gives me and know that what he has given me is enough. And, and when something happens that I don't understand, uh, instead of asking the why question until it drives me crazy, drives me away from the faith, simply go, God hasn't chosen to give me that answer. So I'm going to leave that question in his hands. And I'm going to look around and see what has he given me. Because he has given me the resurrected Christ. He has given me his spirit. He has given me his church. And I'm going to hold on to that and say, that's enough. That's what it's like to live as God's creature in his creation. You can't know everything. But I can know something, and that something is enough. And we also can't do everything. Let me say that again. You can't do everything. So many of us, we, we carry the decision of, our, of our, our lives, our families, the entire world on our shoulders, thinking if I just did this differently, then the entire world, our entire life would be different. You can't do everything. We're limited. Salvation has been won for you on the cross. What did we do to contribute to it? We sinned. We put that on the cross, and yet Christ took that and delivered us. He saved us and forgave us. It's something that we can't do, and yet it's the greatest news of all. To be limited is to acknowledge our need for God. I can't do everything. He can. See, our busyness, our desire to do and to be everything drives us to burn out in every area of life. And yet, when was the Sabbath day created? Again, this is the end of our reading from Genesis. It was created before the fall. Why? Because God knew Adam and Eve were going to you know, work themselves to death in the garden. No. Because by design, before the fall, they were limited. They needed to rest. And so God gave them a day off. It may not make sense to them. It's a gift of God, and God's gifts are enough. We can't do everything, but we can do something. See, it's not for us in God's creation just to sit back and say, well, someone else will take care of it. No, God placed Adam and Eve in the garden to do something, to take care of it. He's placed us in his creation to do something, to take care of it, and not just the world around us. But the people God has given us, including, by the way, yourself. To take care of yourself, to take a day off, to go to a doctor, to talk to a counselor, to be with other people, that is part of our care of creation because you have been made in the image of God. It's not selfishness, it's stewardship. We can't do everything. We can do something. 
that we take care of the body, the soul, the people that God has created us to be, and also who is he placed around you. You can't do everything, but you can do something. As we love and forgive and serve those around us. And then at the end of the day, all those things that we could have done and probably should have done, couldn't get done, we put that in the hand of our God. We say, Lord, I've done what I can. I've done something. I'm going to leave it up to you to do the rest. Now, does that life sound so bad? Does that sound so much worse than, than running around trying to know everything, do everything, be everything? God invites us as his creation to rest. To rest, holding our hands open, knowing what he gives us is enough. So recognize the limits that God has placed for you in terms of time and resources and abilities. See that as a, as a blessing. And then see what can I do within the limits God has placed me with the 24 hours he gives me, with the skills he's given me, with the people he's placed in my life. How can I be faithful? And sharing the one thing that matters. Our Savior who comes to us, who redeems us, who places us at the back of his creation to serve and to love. Our God who we don't fully understand, but who does reveal himself to us as a father who created and who cares for us, as a son who is with us, as a spirit who is in us. That's who our God is. And it's enough. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God which passes our understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until it calls you home. Amen. At this time, I invite uh, the kids to come forward. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do this, but uh, we're going to do a children's message in this general area. So, kids, people who feel like kids, someone needs to get up and stretch their legs. Come on over. When God created life in the very beginning, did he turn on a flashlight? No. What did he do? He said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. Right? God said it, and it happened. When, when thinking about the moon and the stars, how were those created? God said it, and what happened? Exactly what he said. Thinking about the, the, the plants and the animals. What happened? God said it. And it happened. But God's word does what it says it's going to do. It's it true in creation. Uh, when we think about Jesus, uh, when we think about Jesus' miracles, uh, there was a man who was lying on a mat and he couldn't walk. And, got, and, and uh, Jesus saw him and he said, get up. Take your mat and go. And what happened? He got up, he took his mat, and he went. There's a man who was blind. And, and Jesus spoke. And he could see. Because when Jesus says something, that's what happens. So when, when Jesus says to you and to me, and, and oftentimes we hear this through the, through the voice of, of our pastor, when he says, I forgive you your sins, what happens? Your sins are forgiven because when God says something, it happens. Right? In baptism, when God says to you, you are my child, what happens? You are God's child. Right? And when, when God says that, that you are, are welcome in his family, that your sins are forgiven, you're welcome home, and that one day he will bring you home to heaven, what's going to happen? Exactly what God says. Not because of anything we've done, but because when God says something, 
exactly what happens. And what God says to you is that you are loved, you are forgiven, you are his child. And that's exactly who you are. Let, let's pray. I'm going to say a few words and you guys repeat those back to God, okay? Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for saving us, for, saving us, for forgiving us, us, and for calling us, into your family. Help us to trust your word because you do what you say you're going to do. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can head back and uh, find your, your seats wherever uh, you're sitting today. And we're going to, uh, are we going to bring that box over? We should probably just, let's just, yeah. We're going to bring the offering box over. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, uh, you set limits on us as your creatures, and you are our good creator, and you give us all things, everything that we need. Uh, we give back to you this day a portion of what you've given to us. We pray that you bless us and keep us. Uh, this day, use these our tithes and offerings uh, for your purposes. Help us to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our prayers today, uh, just a couple of, of specific petitions. We won't uh, do the names that we normally do. Please keep praying for those guys individually. Uh, but a couple of specific ones for this week. First of all, we want to thank God for 36 years of marriage for Myron and Tracy Bollinger. They're celebrating that on Tuesday the 6th. Um, we want to pray for Ken Rowe. Also, Ken's having surgery tomorrow, and so we want to pray that goes well. And uh, for Hank Wright, Hank, Hank's here also, he's got a broken collar going, so we're pray that that heals quickly. Uh, let's pray. As a community of God's forgiven people, we pray for the church, for ourselves, asking that you help us fully engage in service to, to God and ministry to one another. Try you, God, in your mercy. We pray for the world in which we are living, asking that there be times of peace and security in our deep days, bringing us the blessings of contentment and joy, trying God in your mercy. We pray for those who use their gifts as a teaching and benefit for beneficial instruction. We pray for learners, especially our young people who graduated this past month from educational institutions. Lord, in your mercy. We make petitions for the sick and all who this day need our prayers. Remember especially Ken Ray, Hank White, and all those we named before you in our hearts. We pray that they would be supported by God's people as they await God's direction for their lives according to his gracious will, trying God in your mercy. With thank thankfulness for the gift of civic liberty, we ask God's blessing on our nation, on its leaders, on all who bring security and a sense of community to our lives. Grant that we cherish the freedoms and the sense of peace that we enjoy and do all in our power to maintain public good in our communities. Praying God in mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you shower on us, and we thank you especially this day uh, for the 36 years of marriage that you've granted to Myron and Tracy Bowling, and we pray that you would bless them, keep them in the year uh, ahead of them, and continue to always be the center of their lives and their relationships. Praying God in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
So our last song is Almighty Father, uh, Bless the Word. Uh, the, the last verse of this is the doxology verse. And so we'll, we'll stand uh, on that verse. Um, I thought there was something else, but I don't think so. <laughs> Special voters meeting on June 14th at 7 o'clock. We're voting on uh, issuing some calls and then some other staffing stuff that we need to talk about um, for, for the upcoming school year. Um, uh, second uh, announcement is that BBS is coming up. It's that same week. It's June 12th through 16th. Registration is at uh, ZionBethalta.org. You can do it right on the web website. It's, uh, you just scroll down a little bit when you get there. Um, after DBS, repairs on the church should be started, which is really exciting. Uh, before that, construction company is going to start storing materials in the East Conference Room. That's the one over by the elevator. So uh, effective immediately, we won't be able to use that room until the repairs are done. If you've got anything scheduled to happen in that room, just uh, let us know in the office, and we'll, we'll make other arrangements. We'll get that figured out. Um, Last chance to sign up for soccer. If uh, you would like to sign up for soccer, we are short, it's a co-ed league. Uh, we're short on female players right now. If you, would be, if you would be interested in signing up for 18 plus co-ed soccer, uh, come talk to me uh, this morning and we'll, we'll get that figured out. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, deadline to register for the next Zion Golf Tournament, which is on June 25th. The deadline is June 11th, which is next Sunday. Uh, so make sure you register before then. Um, let me give you a couple instructions on uh, how to do things from this point forward, uh, where food is, that kind of stuff, and then we'll pray and we'll be done. Um, Marla, are you out here? 